Episode 14, Uncuffing Mother Nature with Charles Massey. Welcome to Thriving with Nature, a podcast that gives you the tools you need to live a modern lifestyle that helps regenerate our planet. And now your host, Hayley Weatherburn. All right, welcome Thrivers. My name is Hayley Weatherburn and I'm very excited to bring you a very special guest today. I uh, first came across Charles Massey here. Welcome, Charles. I'm about to talk about you. <laughs> Welcome. Um, Great to meet you, honey. Thank you. So I was watching a documentary. It was a very short documentary called From the Ground Up, and it was about four regenerative farmers in Australia. And this is where I first saw Charles, and he mentioned his book, Call of the Reed Warbler. And I didn't even know what those words meant altogether. I didn't realize a reed warbler was a beautiful bird. Uh, And so I grabbed the book and then later I did soil advocacy training and his book was one of the recommended ones as well and I was already halfway through. So it's very exciting. Not only that, I've learned about Charles or Charlie (laughs) uh, is that um, he not only did a Bachelor of Science when he first went to university, he came back 35 years later after much experience on the farm and did a PhD in human ecology. You've received an Order of Australia Medal for Service as Chair and Director of a number of research organisations and uh, wood boards, uh, sorry, wool (laughs) wool boards. Um, And uh, he's also been on TED, he's done a TED talk, a TEDx talk, which uh, I recommend you go and have a look and I'll make sure there's some links around. But overall, you are a great storyteller. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to share everything that you talk about in Call of the Reed World Block. Well, as much as we can talk about in the short time we have. <laughs> so welcome. Thanks very much, Hayley. Um, great to be here. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, uh, how, how is the farm? Where, where is the farm? Something you talk about in the book uh, and you, you introduce the different stages. Where's the farm right now at this point in time? What's happening on the farm? Uh, well, a number of things, but probably not enough is the answer. We, uh, we, we're on the uh, sort of rain shadow eastern side of the Snowy Mountains in Australia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a high, dry tableland. And yeah. uh, we're about to get our first frost because those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, we're going into winter. So this is sort of mid-autumn, if you like. Unfortunately, we've just missed all the rain with the rain shadow effect and um, going into our fourth year of drought. Wow. And that, that's when your management of the land tells because from our boundary 40 kilometres into town, it's all dust. Uh, mm. the, the, there's no regenerative farming, it's traditional. And when we get a big wind, the dust blows. And, and uh, so what we've, we've done is send our sheep. Uh, it's out, uh, we sometimes run cattle, but it's mainly sheep. So we've sent them off what's called adjustment, put them on paddocks over the mountains, etc., where there is grass just to let our country not get destroyed and let the, uh, the, the beautiful native perennials seed down, et cetera. So yeah, wow. that's where we are with the farm um, mm. and that's going to be expensive and not much income on top of, you know, COVID-19, but yeah. uh, it's nurturing the land and saving it for the future. And um, But aside from all that, this time of year here, the switch into winter, our autumns are beautifully peaceful and the mountain robins have just come down from the mountains to spend the winter and um, a lot of movement of other birds and uh, wallabies and kangaroos and things coming in, sometimes for worse because um, yeah. the kangaroos destroy fences and, yeah, so it's a lovely time of year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's such a biodiversity. I mean, you share a lot of that. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, your grandson, Hamish. He, he seems to be quite a pivotal moment in your life when you were driving along uh, and he asked you the question, why do we have to kill things to grow things? Why do you think at that particular time it provoked such an exploration for you? Yeah, look, uh, he's now 13, but he was about, only about six or seven and uh, mm. I was driving into our local town, Kuma, that 40-kilometre trip with my son-in-law and, and Hamish, who's my shadow really, he loves the farm and the animals. Mm. And we drove past a farmer who had a big spray rig out and he was, he was spraying Roundup, glyphosate. Mm. And um, we'd been discussing other things. We're going into soccer for him. But he suddenly said um, at that age, um, 
grandpa, why do we have to kill things to grow things, as you just said? Mm. And I, was, I couldn't answer him on the spot. It was a hell of a question. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, and the simple answer is we don't. We don't have to kill things to grow things. Mm. Um, we now know we can grow crops equivalent or better than industrial yields without any chemicals, fertilisers, just by doing it differently, sowing into native pastures, sowing multi-species cover crops, which mimics nature, all those sorts of things. And we can certainly graze animals and vegetables, fruits, uh, within the row cropping and letting nature be the pest controller. So we can do it without the industrial inputs. And um, I, I didn't explain that at the time to him. I just sort of sat there rather stunned. <laughs> it was a profound. Yeah, yeah. It's... it's um... We're going to go into quite a lot of the human social. You talk about the emergent mind and that was obviously one of the little sort of things on your mind during, you know, your own process. You, you said um, you started off being an industrial farmer and then had your own ep epiphanic moments um, that inspired you to shift to that. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I had to, uh, I was at university in the early 70s, I uh, didn't just do zoology, but also human ecology. It was the first course in Australia of holistic thinking. There's only a few courses in the world. So mm -hmm. I guess that influenced me. And yet, despite that, at the age of 22, I had to come home when my father had a major heart attack and take over the farm. Mm. And growing up on a farm doesn't mean you know how to manage it. <laughs> so uh, he was pretty ill. And so I asked the best advice around, did a lot of reading. And of course, at that time, in the, uh, I'm talking about uh, about 1975, 76, um, there wasn't much regenerative agriculture around. So all the best farmers, in inverted brackets, and some of them were really good farmers and stockmen, but it was all industrial. So I, I sort of tried to become a good industrial farmer, which I did uh, to my, um, you know, a bit of shame now. I, a couple of years we even sprayed chemicals and that. But we then walked in the late 70s, early 80s into a five-year drought. Mm. And by then I had a valuable sheep, merino sheep started growing beautiful fibre for the Italians and I thought that was my main asset. Mm. Whereas uh, our natural resources, the land and the soil is the main asset, but I didn't know that at the time. And so we kept feeding these sheep and, and keeping them uh, on the farm and eventually they did what I'm seeing today down the road of uh, we destroyed the pasture and it was dust. And we went into a huge debt. Mm. And uh, so at the end of all that, I just walked away and said, wow, um, that was crazy. Um, saddle ourselves with debt, the land took a long while to recover. And uh, that, if you like, as I show in my book, mm. one, of the, one of the big stimuli of change is those head cracking moments, that the life mm. shock. And for me, um, that was my sort of change moment. And then I started to explore and research, can we do it differently? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, we talk, you talk about that. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later as well um, in regards to what's going on globally at the moment. But I, I want to come back to, um, so on your journey, you discovered that there's five uh, landscape functions that, I, and correct me if I'm wrong from my understanding, is that if you even if you just focus on one of those five, the rest will follow. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the five landscape functions for those people that don't even know what that is. And that yeah, is. I mean, it's not like I've invented it. It's there in the literature and the knowledge. But mm -hmm. the, the reason I had damaged my country was because I was landscape illiterate. I, I couldn't read my landscape. I hadn't been taught the ABCs. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, um, when I was at, as an undergraduate in the um, 70s, when we studied agriculture, the, the only physics and chemistry were taught, not soil biology. Mm. So when I went back, you know, 35 more years later, I, I was able to sit in on some of the undergraduate teaching and the same story. It was still chemistry and physics, hardly an acknowledgement of soil biology, which is the key driver. And it was that and then starting to research and, and look at what the good farmers were doing that I realised I had been totally literate. I couldn't read that functional aspect. And so uh, to summarise it, and I, I divide the book into, uh, well, a number of sections, but it it's hinges around the early part of the book, those five functions with, with one, you know, great stories about how farmers might have focused mm -hmm. on one. But as you said, 
if you say regenerate your soil with good biological inputs and multi-species um, yes it's going to increase your soil biology but it also increases a thousandfold the capacity of that soil to retain water mm. and with that comes biodiversity for pest control and um uh, and, and, and your soil mineral cycle gets working because you've now got the biology bringing in the minerals to make healthy food instead of sort of industrial empty stuff. And so that's really the ABC of reading landscapes. It's understanding how it functions. And once you, you, you can sort of get that, your head around that, mm. your whole perception changes and, and you, you begin to read uh, whether landscapes are healthy or not, whether they're changing, how you, you've got to be more sensitive and reaction, react a lot quicker if you're managing, those sorts of things. And uh, I was totally oblivious, totally blind before. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I talked in a podcast a couple of weeks ago and it's something that I'm exploring. I feel that I haven't quite been able to articulate it and I'd love your view on this, is that I believe there's a force of nature. And so if you... If you walk along this force of nature, your, your human health, your nature, the environment, everything thrives. It naturally grows in a succession. Whereas if you step off out of it, as I imagine this sort of an invisible force field, that if you start stepping away from this force of nature, you start eating processed foods or you start putting chemicals in, I, I see this image of the body starting to break down and the environment starting to break down. I'm wondering what your thoughts are because it's 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 very magical to me when I and I am still discovering it. But what do you see this force of nature is? Yeah, look, you've, you've articulated that it. it's 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 like some of that Eastern mysticism. You can <laughs> you can describe a particular uh, you know picture or, or uh, action four or five different ways, and mm. uh, that's one way of doing it. Mm. If you what. <laughs> The best way um, I can describe it is, you know, you can imagine um, I went back in my uh, late 50s to become a student again, having been away for a lot of time. I had a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> and, and the time I'd been away, um, mind you, at, with all these young undergraduates around me, I knew how to cut the corners a lot better than they did, even though I wasn't as computer literate, but that's <laughs> by the by. Um, <laughs> I had a lot of catching up to do because since I'd left uni, we'd had the, compu the uh, electronic age, the computer age, systems thinking, and then soft systems thinking. We transformed the way we think about how big systems work. Mm. And then I, I discovered key biologists around the world who'd worked in the soft systems area. And, and, and the, the, the concept of systems thinking beautifully describes the complexity of how a natural system works. Mm. And it's called complex adaptive systems. I have, have, I've had to get my head around it to deal, mm -hmm. to teach a master's and third year students. Yeah. And I'm not, not going to bore people silly now, but um, there's about 12 characteristics of a complex adaptive system. And look, a complex adaptive system is one that it can be um, the World Wide Web. It can be a city. It can be a landscape or a natural system. It's just that it's incredibly complex and there's, there's reactions and interactions and adjustments, basically. Mm. So in biology and, and nature, um, there's a few key characteristics of these complex systems which have taken millions and millions of years to evolve, the species, the interactions, how they work. And, and the two that really hit me in the eye um, is that if you start to work positively again with a destabilised landscape, you're taking the handcuffs off her and enabling her to self-organise back to the healthy state that she's been working towards or, or had previously. Yeah. And how does she do that? Um, nature does that because residing within, say, that landscape or that farm, uh, and they could be dormant microorganisms or a few earthworms or whatever it is, if you start to take the handcuffs off nature and let her get on with what she's good at, mm. that's self-organising, those properties that she uses are called the emergent properties. They're there and they're allowed to be released. And uh, that, in, in, in a short verse, and I cover this in the book without getting too heavy, mm. but that to me, uh, when I got my head around that, it just explained it. So the minute we start to simplify uh, any one of those functions badly managed, we're shutting that whole process back down again. And uh, 
But the minute we start taking our first steps to let nature do what she's good at, that whole self-organisation process will get going and the positive elements and then you get disease resistance and health and lots of nutrients in your food and the whole box and dice, yeah. Yeah, it's so, it's so interesting. I did a little presentation how when we try and do what nature does, we, we, we don't understand the huge complexity of it. Like there's farmers out there trying to replace the soil food web. And it's so complex that we can, we only, and we only know, you know, the tip of the iceberg right now, you know, in 1996, we only learn about glomalin, you know, so it's, it's, it's fascinating when, if we go, we don't need to know it all and understand it all. But if we, I love what, how you put it, you take the handcuffs of her. She, she has the knowledge and nourish and support her. I think you said, we just have to nourish things and, you know, use that unconditional love and and treat it with that respect it will do it all we don't need to know it all it's, it's stepping out of our ego and and surrendering to that absolutely right and it's it's seeing ourselves where we sit within nature and that's not on top it's mm. just one of a myriad of species and uh, i often start talks now to students just to get them thinking that the definition of, re- of regenerative agriculture is the enablement of self-organization to work In other words, us stepping back, stopping the dominance, doing things that enables that co-evolve long history to get going again. And uh, and that that means allowing the emergent properties and the whole thing. That's so true. I think it was um, the Weatherstones in Linfield Park, you, you tell so many stories. I, I was, there was just so many from Africa, America, uh, all of Australia, which was really good for me as an Australian to just see what is going on in there. Um, the, the Weatherstones in Linfield Park, he talked about, I think it was John, John Weatherstone, is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. He said, I just have to listen to the land, respond to its needs, be prepared to, con- um, be prote- prepared to uh, you know, change uh, and just um, yeah, just completely surrender to, to to what is is. And he said, just stepping away and watching, observing. That's you know, I talked about observation in my last podcast on Friday about I have this image. You talk about it. You know, every morning you're just observing. You're looking at what insects there are, what the birds are. I asked you this morning. You know what's going on. And you're reading, you're reading, you're starting to read the landscape. You're understanding, okay, if these are here, that means this is flowering now or um, observing. It's fascinating. It's magical. <laughs> it is magical. And um, I, th- I, think, uh, for, for I think most of us that have made this shift, it's, it's that interaction with nature that gives the true joy and meaning in life in a way. And, and um, it's, 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 it's just about... It's actually about humility. I mean, um, you know, having been an industrial farmer, I made the mistakes. There's an arrogance, if you like. I don't want to denigrate everyone in industrial farming. There's there's good and bad and uh, and there's tools and methods there that we need to use. But just talk about myself as an industrial farmer. Um, There's an arrogance. I thought I was in charge. I could control and dominate. So you you plough or whatever, you simplify things so you can put in a monoculture crop, you're in control. Mm. But you're actually not. You, you know, you're actually destabilising the system and uh, and it's only when you realise that you're only a minuscule part of this enormous sort of universe that uh, that the humility comes and you realise that, well, um, the best I can do is get out of the bloody way, really. Yeah, exactly. Rather than try and swim through the waves that keep crashing on you, surf them, come back. And, and um, yeah, it's it's... It's, uh, I just saw an image and, and, I, and then I've lost it. But, yeah, it's, it's, I, I see this and from, you know, as an Australian I used to grow up and, you, you know, in the last years you've seen, you know, the drought and what it's doing. And actually when I first saw that documentary um, from the ground up, I, I was Googling something and literally in that same day there were you, you four that were doing regenerative agriculture and there was a, an article in one of the Australian newspapers of four farmers struggling with drought not knowing and I was like how does this ha- this 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 and and the energy of the people that are really struggling it feels like they're like you said the monocrop they're you're trying to control it but it's actually you're trying to push against a wall that's all it's it's this nature this force of nature is not going to ever 
give and when you finally there's like a relief would i imagine that once you started going this path did you feel this sense of relief of like okay i just have to understand this language now that's true uh and i think when you've you're invested in um the dominate and control approach and then things go wrong with droughts fail crops there's a huge mental health component goes with that mm. and uh, i'm not saying in this we're into our fourth year of drought, but I'm on top of things. But there's so many positives to keep you up mm. uh, rather than, you know, okay, we're not, we're not going to make any money this year, but um, we've got healthy family, a lot of healthy food coming off uh, vegetable gardens and, uh, and the meat we eat and, um, and nature is still functioning and, and we're not looking at dust blowing like some of the neighbours. So uh, the mental health aspect uh, reflecting back on my previous period is quite significantly different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I was about to, to say, before we step up and we go quite global, um, how do you compare the last drought that you went through, which was during your mechanical mind you talk about, and now you've got this regenerative emergent mind, how would you compare the two? I look vastly different. Uh, if I think this drought's worse and yet we've got grass cover and native seeds seeding down and stuff because we've, we've we sold. The bit, I'm probably going into a bit of detail. When you, when you do, say, regenerative grazing, which we are, it's mm -hmm. called um, plant control grazing, whatever you want to call it, but you've got some really excellent tools that allows you to estimate how much grass or feed you've got and then you calculate how much the animals are going to eat. And, and so you get very precise tools, especially when you read the landscape better, that allows you to sell your animals as your production's declining. So you're selling well three or four months before those that are hanging on and feeding and belting the land. Mm. So you're selling when the markets are good and the animals are fat and you're putting that money away. Whereas in the uh, my first big droughts, um, I, I sold when it was too late. The animals had slipped in condition. The markets were disastrous. I remember sending... Um, 500 sheep into the uh, the markets in that first big drought and I had to send a check with them because the transport cost more oh, than the sheep. Wow, yeah. Uh, and, and so it's it, there's a lot of co-benefits to come with it. But this this drought currently isn't our, uh, only our second drought. We've had about two or three in between. Yeah. This is a failure. But the difference is we, we've, we've learned to make those early decisions and uh, it was a result of the, the, the drought after that first one when my mind was shifting that we said okay that's it and so what we did was we held a big clearing sale uh, a big public sale with all our industrial equipment big tractors big mm -hmm. combines spray machines drought feeding gear and um, because I, I wanted to be firm about it I, I, it was like Cortez landing in Mexico yeah. and, and scuttling the boats I wanted yeah. to make sure we had no chance <laughs> no retreat. going back <laughs> that's right that was symbolic and uh, that we were already on the journey, yeah. Yeah, yeah, wow. That's, it's, that's really good to hear that, 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 I mean, it's not great to hear that there's drought and unfortunately that's part of the Australian um, <laughs> climate, um, but it's really awesome to see that there is hope for farmers during this time that, that can really help them um, manage and, and, and go through that. So... Uh, I want to take this a little bit global, as as you and I both know. Uh, no one on this planet is uh, <laughs> uh, what is the word? No one has escaped the COVID nineteen um, experience. This this huge shift that's happening happening globally. Um, and I'm curious to see you talk about the Anthropocene Anthropocene <laughs> crisis, and I'm I'm wondering how this all fits into it and what's going on right now as far as what you've researched and seen and, and, and what's happening. Yeah, uh, the key question now for our very survival. <laughs> um, the last, until about the 1950s or let's go back maybe in the late 19th century with the Industrial Revolution, mm. until then, um, I don't know what that noise was, but anyway. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> <Very much. laughs> That's fine. And until then, we'd had this unique phase of Earth's history called the um, Holocene, mm -hmm. about 12,000 years of it mm -hmm. after the Ice Ages, when Earth moved into this unique phase of, of the ideal temperatures, the ideal carbon dioxide levels, etc., 
uh, for for a lot of nature to thrive. Uh, and that, that's why within a few thousand years of the end of the Ice Ages, uh, agriculture began. Um, humans in the, uh, if you think about Western agriculture, in that fertile crescent of the Middle East, they, they found some weedy cereal plants, which were they domesticated as our modern cereals. They domesticated sheep and goats and then later cattle. And from that came the rise of agriculture. Uh, ironically, from that rise of agriculture came modern civilization. <laughs> and then post sort of the great scientific revolution and the Renaissance, we had this extraordinary period of human cultural development, you know, the Enlightenment and all that. Mm. But in some respects, it, and it was all a wonderful phase of human culture, but it was also part of it was a disenlightenment because what it did and the American um, uh, I'm brain dead, I'm, I can't think of it, The Death of Nature, um, her name will come. Yeah. It's a book that really influenced me, um, uh, an environmental ecological historian. She, by The Death of Nature, she meant um, how the end of the phase of that extraordinary cultural revolution from, say, the 1700s to the uh, end of the 19th century, we had the rise of the scientific method of thinking, the rise of modern capitalism, etc. And the end result was dissipated the Western civilization mm. from what's called the organic mind, where we didn't see ourselves as separate to Mother Nature. All our religious festivals, our very being, we knew we were intimately tied to her. But once we'd separated, Caroline Merchant is the author, sorry, <laughs> of, the, of the death of nature. Once we'd made the end result of those two or three centuries was this industrial mind where we see ourselves as separate from nature and nature is there to be dominated and controlled. So what I'm leading to, that's a huge schism and it's why we are in, in the deep mess we're in today. Yeah. And so from the, uh, the end of the Industrial Revolution, we just started to pump up more and more carbon dioxide, fossil fuels into the atmosphere, uh, initially coal and then oil. But what's happened post the Second World War is now what is called the Great Acceleration. So if you look at all the indicators, say the social economic indicators, they all show an exponential graph rising. Mm. Um, human population, GDP, the, the things we build to service all that industrial population. And if you look at the, um, the biophysical uh, ones as well, they say that exact, they show exactly the same exponential rise. You know, the, we, humans have precipitated the sixth greatest extinction event ever in Earth. We, we're wiping out half of species mm -hmm. left on the planet. We're consuming huge amounts of water. We're pumping up the methanes and the nitrous oxides and the carbon dioxide, which is destabilising the climate. If anyone wants to question that, think about our summer and, and the droughts um, mm -hmm. and so on. So that's what's now destabilised our Earth system. And um, I often show in the talks that famous photo of the blue planet, that Apollo 11 or whichever one I took, which was... A, it was a metaphor-changing shift. Mm. And um, everyone talks about climate as the problem, but there's actually nine integrated Earth systems that sustain that extraordinary envelope mm. that keeps life on Earth. You know, the water cycle, biodiversity, climate, uh, land use, phosphorus-nitrogen interaction, all those sorts of things. That's without thinking about the chemicals. Um, mm. And... So what's happened is with that combination of things and climate, the fossil fuels, the carbon, we, we, Earth has now left that safe Holocene ideal period and we've moved into this new phase of destabilisation called the Anthropocene, human-made Anthropo. Mm. And the longer we're going into it, we're probably a few decades already into it, the more things are going wrong. You know, climate, global temperature and all that sort of stuff, the amount of carbon we're putting up, I think, I forget the stats, it's something like 70 billion tonnes and we can only draw down about 20, those sorts of things. It's sort of starting to spin out of control. Mm. And really good thinkers like Paul Hawken, who yeah. I have a lot of time for and I work with him with his drawdown and his long history of social activism as well. He's, he and many other good thinkers are saying we've only got one generation, 25 years, to turn this around. And uh, COVID-19 is another spin-off of that great acceleration. Too many people eating the wrong food in close proximity, all those sorts of things, climatic issues. And um, that's really what's driving me on this constant talking and speaking and 
writing thing is that uh, our generation has some responsibility and uh, we have the solutions and we'll, we'll get onto that later, I'm sure. Regenerative Ag has some of the best solutions, but yeah. that's the big overall picture. It's, it's not bullshit. It's mm. there's so much evidence. There's a lot of denial. And I'll just finish by saying the reason the denial is there, if, if you look at that long course of human history from hunter-gatherers to the first civilizations right through to now, Every great civilization, major civilization tells itself a great story. Mm. Could be the king and queen, could be the emperor, could be a religion. Ours is suicidal. It, it's economic rationalism. Both for the sake of it. And all the leading governments subscribe to it. Therefore, all the policy subscribes to it, the government departments, the research institution. So the power right through society is driving this suicidal view and, and things like regenerative agriculture and home food gardens and organics is a real kickback to try and turn that around but that's what we're up against it's it's a, it's a wrong story we tell ourselves as a modern culture yeah it's it's fascinating that we've we've come this way i i, I have this belief that we you know we're just like a, a child that doesn't know to you know pull things off a table until they learn that it's terrible we're, we've we've pulled you know we're starting to awaken and go hang on what we've been doing isn't right and and you know you talk about there's a there's a bit of shame that comes with you know what you've known now but you didn't know any better before there's this this um understanding of like you knew what you knew at the time and you did the best you could at that but now what we're becoming is we're becoming awakened and there is no excuse this anthropocene crisis um, you know, COVID-19, and, and that's actually something I wanted to say, is do you think that the COVID-19 is enough of that, what did you call it, mind-changing shock that could inspire change? And if so, how do we make that connection for people to realise that this, um, this situation is, I mean, we all know it's severe, the whole world is inside right now. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm curious to see how you think we can connect that to 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 drop that in for people. Yeah, that's a, a good question, which probably can't be answered and, until another year goes by. I suspect, but um, <laughs> yeah. um, it's interesting because I'm, I'm currently trying to write an article for an international journal that's um, getting a few different writers to put their perspective on the current moment, mm. and. Um, you know, I, I've sort of half lost my thread of thought, but thread mm. of thought there. But um, there's some interesting um, patterns developing locally. Um, our local organic shop in a little country town, um, it's had its busiest period of trading ever since they began 20 years ago, suddenly. Awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, people are buying, um, we, we've tried to buy some uh, laying hens, what we call chooks. Mm. And, and the usual suppliers uh, sold out months and months and months ahead. Mm. Luckily, our nephew mm. got onto some in Sydney. Uh, and and, the, and the, the sale of vegetable seeds for homegrown food. So mm. um, there's indicators around that there's a shift starting to come from uh, being locked up inside um, isolated, uh, reliant on supermarkets with crap food and uh, some nations run around panicking about toilet paper as if we're going into a major crisis. I, um, I could be, it could be intriguing what happens in America, uh, just seeing the news last night with the collapse of big pig production, mm. poor communities oh. running with food. We, we could be on the edge of social chaos in some of those big old industrial cities. But either way, at the end of this, I... I I hate to use the word I hope, but I, uh, that, yeah, I hope that the message will come through that we cannot keep doing what we're doing. And this might be the sort of first straw on the camel's back that might start to get that message through because the evidence is out there uh, about what we're doing and to the, the, the globe as a whole with the Anthropocene, but the powers, you know, we have this, ironically, we have... The, key world leaders who are all sceptical about climate and all those, those other issues, you know, the worst being Trump. Mm. Uh, but our, our own government here is, is very right-wing and uh, economic rationalist. And, and so it goes on around the world at the very moment, and including in Brazil, guys like that, you know, wanting to clear the, the rainforest. 
it, it's ironic, but it, it's very moment. But maybe they're going to help cause this tipping point, and people will react with disgust at the end of it. Yeah. But, uh, it's- yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I noticed the first thing when I first got told about this and my friend was starting to, you know, say, let's just prepare for the worst, you know, she was running like out the societal expectation is run and go and get the non-perishables. And I was like, I've got to go and get more seeds. <laughs> I was like, if we're in this for the long term, I need to be more self-sufficient. And so, um, at Kiss the Ground did a podcast last week um, reintroducing the Victory Gardens. Now, I, I wasn't around when Victory Gardens, and I only know a little bit about the concept, but I believe it was during World War II, I think it was, that everyone was, um, uh, what was it, inspired or advised to grow their own vegetable yeah. garden, which, which helps the system. And I see this leaning towards... Um, this such a great opportunity and realizing how, and I, I put it in such a crude way that at the moment when everyone was rushing to, to supermarkets and worrying about them emptying is that we're so we're suckling on the teat of the system of supermarkets when it's actually, you can have your own um, growing vegetables forever and not be stuck on dependent on the system is probably what I, I, I mean. So yeah, it's, it's, it is exciting to see that the seeds, I, I've heard that around Australia because I'm in a few groups that we're growing veggies and that people are running out, of, like stocks are running out of seeds, are running out of all sorts, chickens, like you said. Um, so that's inspiring. <laughs> it is. So, uh, I but, mean, one of the things I didn't mention before, and it's just reminded me, I think it comes in here a bit, um, is that those exponential rises of socioeconomic and and the biophysical that I was talking about that led to the Anthropocene. Mm. If you look at the modern health diseases delayed by a decade and a half or two, exactly the same exponential trajectory. Mm. Uh, And and they weren't there in, say, in the early part of the 20th century, the ADHDs and the autisms and the obesity and all that sort of stuff. You know, obesity alone we now know um, on the current trajectory by the mid 2030s, one child in three will have autism. Well, that, that will destroy that economy. And ours is on a similar track. Yeah. And without doubt, this is where I'm leading to with the food issues. Without doubt, it's what we've done to the food by stripping out the, the biology mm. and, and also things like glyphosate getting into our stomachs along with em- nutrient-empty food and triggering the wrong, uh, ep- uh, what's called epigenetics, the wrong switching on and off of the, of the genes of the microbiome. It's directly connected to a lot of those major modern health diseases. And, and if I can just illustrate it with one practical example, if you look at an industrial, say, cereal plant versus a regenerative one in the soil, mm. you, you won't find on the industrial one any of the really valuable root fungus, the microhousal fungi. Yeah. Why I'm mentioning them is that um, they have this partnership with plants. Mm. That the plants photosynthesize, they give them sugar at the root tips, and they have this symbiotic bargain with the plants. Well, we'll go off and source all those nutrients and micronutrients and phytochemicals, you know, which there's hundreds of thousands, just the phytochemicals. Um, but if you go and spray the, uh, those industrial crops, you've got no fungus doing that. Wow. And, and they're waiting for their, for their uh, daily drug dose of... Mm-hmm. Pretty much daily, but they're waiting for their industrial inputs of nitrogen, phosphorus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but in, if, if you then look at the other side, that really healthy soil, in, in one cubic meter of that soil, you could have twenty-five thousand kilometres of the microtubes from the fungi working away to put those nutrients into that plant and that food. So the the implications here of of growing your own food and, and farming in a bigger scale of regenerative of, of having biology do the work it's, it's just enormous and, and uh, in, in terms of human health well-being let alone uh, all those diseases yeah I, i've heard a few farmers say they're not farming cattle farming you know they're farming microbes like at the end of the day it's the microbe that's getting away from being the one who's trying to decide and work out what what um, inputs we need to put in to the many where they have the innate intelligence to find 
the thousands of nutrients that that plant needs. It's and and this brings it to the human health, like you say. You know, back in the day, I, I'm cringing every time we're washing our hands too much is because we're getting away of some of the good microbes as well. It's funny. What I've been doing is I'll, I'll go out if I have a mask and I, I do the alcohol, but I'll come home and then I'll stick my hands in the soil. I'm like, come on, good guys, get back on my skin because <laughs> I'm worried because um, there is that, that direct link of, you know, back in the day, you talked about it in your book when you were a kid, you'd run up and, you know, you'd sneak, a, you'd sneak some veggies from your mum's garden and you'd run up to the mulberry bush and juice running down your mouth and, and all those amazing microbes that you, you know, a bit of dirt in your mouth and that is where our gut flora be, um, becomes so strong and the immune system and we're seeing the crashing down of people's immune systems through the world right now because, um, that hasn't been able to happen. And like you said, not only are the nutrients missing, but also the microbes are missing from our, our fruit and vegetables because it's of the, all the chemicals. So it's, it's so directly linked um, right now, especially with COVID-19, because if you have a strong immune system, yes, you may contract it, but you may not even get symptoms. You may not even, um, you may get a little bit of a cold, but because your immune system is stronger, you are, are now stronger um, against the the virus, um, yeah. Yeah, and the other, the other the other side of that coin you've just described, you know, um, sneaking up the mulberry tree and, and eating an old heritage mulberry. Mm. I mean, the taste explosion in your mouth, let alone the vegetables. <laughs> um, and that's also another part of the problem: the, the nutrient empty food coming off industrial landscapes is, is also exacerbating this whole thing because it's not just the way we treat the soil. With chemicals, etc. It, it's also the the modern breeding approach to, you know, take, taking um, cereals that might have been as high as a human, mm. reducing them to dwarf wheat. So all they do is have maximum production. We, we've lost the drought resilience, the disease resilience, the capacity to access all the nutrients. All those sorts of modern breeding and um, you know transgenic work, interfering with complex nature, all that sort of stuff. It's all part. Of, of contributing to this negative picture. That so uh, I could talk to you for hours, but I know we're coming to the end. Uh, let's talk about how, uh, you know, I, I'm already excited and on the train of regenerative agriculture, studying soil advocacy training with Kiss the Ground. But, um, I mean, regenerative agriculture on the larger scale, you know, the hundreds of thousands of kilometres of, of land to in your veggie garden, um, we uh, there's there's so many benefits of us stepping out of the way, coming back to nature. Can you share a little bit about of the benefits of regenerative agriculture? And I, I yeah, know, yeah, and they're very exciting. Um, one of the guys I've I've uh, worked with and am working with is Paul Hawken, who I've mentioned mm. before. Now, a few years ago, now he got sick of asking climate scientists, "What do we do about it?" And, and, Majority said, well, we don't know, we're just crunching the numbers. So he set out and co-opted, uh, enlisted, employed, whatever, um, 80 or 90 top analysts to come up with the 100 best methods of how we can pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Mm. And they fully costed 80. And, um, and eventually in, in discussion with him, I said, well, look, if you look at the top 20, the 20 best methods of drawing down carbon and, and permanently putting it away in the soil or the ocean or wherever. Uh, if you look at the top 20, 10 of them are regenerative agriculture. And he said, oh, shit, you're right. <laughs> um, in other words, the very best method of addressing climate change is healthy regenerative agriculture, pulling that carbon down, which is what it does. And that's now without getting onto the human health aspects and... Mm. Uh, turning around the water cycle with, you know, I mean, this talk in Australia that aren't we great, we have 25 million people, we feed 60 million. Mm. No one's ever asked at what cost to the Murray-Darling Basin, et cetera. And the reason it's in strife isn't just obviously irrigation for crazy crops like cotton in Australia, which shouldn't be grown. It's the fact that our landscapes have dried out because we've so degraded them and they're not absorbing and holding and reticulating the water. So... Regenerative ag through all those functions and, and across most of those destabilised earth systems has some of the very best solutions. And yeah. that, to me, that's incredibly exciting because it means what you're doing for your job 
you're hugely contributing to a global situation and human health at the same time. Exactly. There's there's such a global um, effect as well of, you know, we went through the seven week course and, you know, not only is it, does it, when you align and if you manage it right, it can be more profitable. Your, that small documentary showed, you know, the farmers, how you all have made it, you know, because it takes away a lot of the inputs and the costs and the overheads. Um, but it's the human health, the climate change when we talk about carbon, the water um, absorption. Now, I'm, I'm not going to remember the number and I should, but it's, it's like, is it 26,000? I can't remember if it was litres or... Um... Um, look, there's a, a number of research projects, um, uh, research work, but one of them uh, which summarises it and, and there's higher figures, but... Mm. It's actually a farmer up in the north coast doing his masters did this. Um, if we can put just one percent more carbon back in the soil, yeah. that soil can store more than an extra hundred and forty thousand liters of water. It's sort it's, of no-brainer stuff in a dry continent. <laughs> I know, right? It's insane. And because of that, because it's absorbing and going down and refilling our aquifers and, and things, there isn't it isn't rushing and washing away our topsoils and, and causing floods in some areas. And it's um, yeah, and then of course the temperature. If you, when you when you're growing, we, we talked we touched this on the last week. It was the the cycle, how it actually forests can um, bring rain, and I'm probably not going to remember the right word, but there's a, a a smaller cycle of rain than it can bring. Um, yeah, I was just going to come to that actually. Yeah, it's it's critical if you want to go back quickly into from the domestication of agriculture. Mm. Once we started to overgraze and plough, we, we, we've taken the first steps to creating deserts of desertification. Mm. And, and if you look at Australia, where the wrong techniques that have evolved for a moist, rich soil Europe with, with a lot of rain and soft rain, mm. those techniques were devastating in Australia. We've done more damage in 200 years than anyone. Mm. What, what's happened is that we've taken out the regional, local, small water cycle with yeah. a lot of mist bogs and uh, and it, when that's really functioning well, you know, of an evening you've got about a foot of uh, moisture at about 99% relative humidity and, uh, and uh, every night, you're not every night of the year but most nights, you're absorbing one to two millimetres of rain. That's an extra 12 to 15 inches of rain in a year. Yeah, wow. That's all gone. Complex in Australia because not just bad farming, but we got rid of the small burrowing marsupials who spread the, the, the fungus who are key for that water absorption. And once you lose the small water cycle, all those mists and fogs, um, that impacts the larger water cycles. So instead of big hydrotic pumps bringing in moisture off the ocean to a well-vegetated landscape, we're exporting moisture off our landscape back into the ocean. So we've reversed both cycles. Yeah, it's crazy well. stuff. <laughs> and, and we're still, every time you see bare country, ploughed, fallowed or overgrazed, that's a sign of desertification. And, yeah. and Australia's in denial. No one wants to talk about desertification. Yeah, well, I think with the re recent bushfires, I feel, I feel that was another moment that hopefully activated a lot of people into working with the Indigenous and the, the fire, what is it, the cold fires and bringing yeah. back that, that cold burn um, cycle as well. Um, just to, <laughs> I could go on, um, but just to, to, to tie this off, I mean, regenerative agriculture on all levels really can solve us from our own human health. Like if you're feeling healthy, you want to get, if you want to feel healthier in this time and build your immune system, grow your own veggies. But also if you can't grow your own veggies, it's reaching out to farmers like yourself or, or um, I don't know if they have, do they have CSAs in Australia where you can get your you know, regenerative farmer, you can get your veggies delivered and start to have a bit of soil. You know, if I know it's coming from a regenerative agriculture farm or an organic farm, I'll eat it without washing it because I want those, <laughs> those microbes. That's right. Uh, so uh, my last question for you is, my, one of my favourite quotes is by Buckminster Fuller and he said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And yep. so um, what do you suggest the everyday person or even the farmers listening to this, what do you think the first step is to creating that new model that we can all start to, to move across to? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, the, the new model also includes the old. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, 
peasant agricultures around the world, so-called peasant, have done it with nature before industrial agriculture for a long while. Um, I think if addressing uh, the consumer, urban people, uh, yep. start to grow some of your own, but, but, but if you want to have really healthy food to, to, for your family and yourself, start sourcing it as much as you can from farmer's markets or organic sections, et cetera. I'd, I'd far, rather trust a farmer's market than a big industrial retailer's organic section, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and um, from the farmer's point of view, um, because this is a challenge to a major paradigm and we don't want to chuck all, everything out of the old, no. just do your homework. Go and visit some of these farms and talk to the farmers, see what they're doing, really burrow in on the finances and is it as good as it's cracked up to be? Because you know, inevitably the enthusiasts in any new shift will tend to over-exaggerate at times. So go to the best operators, see what's happening uh, and just do your homework. But I, I think... Once the shift is made, whether you're the consumer or the practitioner, it, it, you'll find it is so rewarding and it's so much life. is it, Instead of dealing with a lot of negatives, you're dealing with a lot more positives and it's, it's exhilarating and it's an exciting network that you're interacting and learning. It's also about constant learning, as you, as you know. Yes. Uh, it's the ground and those sort of people. There's, there's a lot of terrific stuff out there. And, and, you know, and get on the web. Have a look at the uh, YouTubes and everything and just find out what is out there because it's quite remarkable. Yeah, and, and look, the first place to start, I would say, is to grab Call of the Reed Warbler, um, Charles's book. Not only does it, it has great stories, we really connect with, you know, what's going on for you on the farm. You take us through your own journey of um, um, growing through from industrial to your own emergent um, mind. You, there must be about 50 different farmers that you visited and stories inside there and their experiences because they've all got different ones and different farms so it's a great place to start to understand not only from the ground level but also on a global level especially when you talk about you know the five landscape functions and the anthropocene crisis and everything so um yeah i will put links below um thank you so much for your time charles tali <laughs> um i am just so grateful i could have spoken to you for another few hours there's so many more things i, I would have loved to have talked about in the book maybe we'll have to connect again another time but thank you so much for your time no pleasure Haley, and keep up the good work it's um regenerating earth is really important yeah thank you hey if you enjoyed listening to my podcast remember to subscribe to hear more you also have to come check out the thriving with nature website where all of my videos podcasts and resources are to take what we discuss here to the next level and apply it in real life I'd love to have you come join myself and many others striving towards living a regenerative lifestyle. Go to thrivingwithnature.com.